2015, we had the refugio oil spill in Santa Barbara where the plane's pipe bursted and about 100,000 gallons of oil uh, seeped into the water uh, along the Gabbana coast. So that caused a lot of beaches to be oiled, um, a lot of tar. Uh, so I did an analysis on uh, the effects of that petroleum on the embryo development of sand crabs. So we took some pregnant sand crabs, they're called buried crabs. Uh, we took them to uh, to the lab, we grabbed their, their eggs. The old lab, this is pre Sierra Hall. Oh, yeah, this is the old lab. This is back in Modoc. <laughs> yeah. <It's>, uh, <laughs> Your favorite? Modoc. Your favorite. <laughs> I'm guessing that's a problem. All right. So, uh, so I brought them back to the lab. Uh, I put these eggs. I, I introduced them to uh, controlled environments. Uh, some, so two environments were were controlled. They had clean seawater. The other ones were uh, contaminated with fresh and weathered tar. And I actually found that in the control, the eye spots of these embryos developed faster uh, than the ones that were contaminated with fresh and weathered tar. I found that uh, the eye spots were more prevalent in the clean seawater. You can see these little black dots in those. Those are eye spots. Up here, this is tar. This is tar water. And the eye spots are either extremely tiny or not prevalent at all in, this, in, in the embryos. Um, I also found that overall species biodiversity, uh, species richness, and heterogeneity, uh, measure of evenness and species richness, uh, was decreased uh, during the, the oil spill of these sandy beaches. Uh, Dorothy has done all of her research on microplastics. So it's cool. So Tevin and I went to the Cooks together, and so we've been, you know, research buddies all summer. So we found that sand crabs actually ingest microplastics. So the way we found that is when we got back from the Cooks, Dr. Steele and I were talking about, hey, what should we do for capstone? We said, what about the microbeads? thing? It's really important. So these are the microbeads that come out of all the fun face washes and toothpaste and gross. So you know about the band and everything. So we, in the lab, exposed the crabs to microbeads to see if they would them or not. One of them did, but the rest of them had ambient fibers already in their digestive tract, like this guy. So you can see, like, it looks like a little piece of hair, but it's actually a fiber inside their digestive tract. So then we went... So but, but, but emphasize that. So the controls had that. The controls had them. So before we ever did anything. Stuff from the beach. Stuff from the beach that. that we just brought in. Gross. So then we thought, all right, well, what else should we find? So we went out and everywhere from San Francisco all the way down to San Diego, with help from other schools, have sent crabs to us. And I've processed 24 of the beaches. At least 10% of every single population has ingested some kind of micro particle, whether a micro bead or a fiber or something gross. So over break, we got to test that FTIR microscope, and we found polyethylene, polyurethane, polyacrylate, as well as like cellulose and some synthetic fibers. The problem with all of that is they act like little velcro pieces for persistent organic pollutants. And we know that those pollutants cause endocrine disruption in other species, as well as issues with human consumption. So crabs, you know, they're little, they're gross, people use them fish and whatnot. But sea otters eat crabs, other fish and birds eat crabs, so it's all part of the ecosystem. So it's easy for us to collect it because they're part of the beach and they're in the yard. 